I just wanted to welcome you. This is the first for us uh, in a series of town halls and events that are going to be held around the values journey that we're going to take. The chancellor here will be leading the conversation and here just to be the set up man and uh, to make sure that everyone knows that this is an exercise that's going to be able to go from university. So just in kind of thinking about this beforehand. We've been through a lot of different exercises over the years, even since I've been here. And of course, prior to that, there were strategic plans, there were vision statements, there were uh, values that were selected. I don't like magnetic refrigerator poetry in which groups of people got together and threw a bunch of words against the wall and wrote them down and then forgot about them. So what does it mean to be a values-driven organization? And, and I'm not trying to steal any thunder from our chancellor who's done this wherever he's been, but I guess it means we should say things we believe in and then follow through on them. We've had branding exercises. Uh, we had one with Carnegie Dartlet system wide. And they, after paying them a significant amount of money, came up with three words for us that we have used. Resilience, creativity, caring. But from my perspective, maybe only one of those words really stuck to the wall. And that's the word caring. And it turns out that every university in the country says they're a caring university. Now, I happen to believe for us, that rings true. I've been to a bunch of universities and I've never seen a more caring group of people, people who cared about each other, people who cared about our mission and our students. That is a value. But what is it we really stand for? What are we really trying to achieve? And when we hire people and look at colleagues, what do we expect from them? And I would submit to you that we would like them to live by the values of our community. So how do we figure those out? We have a wonderful system now. Three universities and a, and a system four. Is it possible that we can all get together and share a common set of values that help to guide us as we grow and move into the future? And so we're asking all of you to participate in this launch. Feel free to ask questions. Feel free to engage. Feel free to offer your commentary and your thoughts. There will be a process that's laid out. Are you going to talk more about the process specifically? Not as much. Not as much here. Okay. We'll talk more about the ideas behind it. We'll just say that October 26th and 27th, there'll be the beginning of an engagement. And I believe that this is a campus wide engagement. Again, you're invited to participate. Uh, and then November 7th and 8th, mm -hmm. there will be uh, with a group that was broadly selected from across campus and from the other campuses, a two day uh, values workshop in which a great deal of the heavy lifting should be done. I know we have representation from good folks like Adam and faculty Senate and others on this committee. Uh, it's, it is not executive heavy. It is filled with the people who are the bricks and mortar that holds our university together. So for those of you who are going to participate, thank you. And there's one thing I know for sure. As we do this, we have an opportunity to express our values, what we believe in. And if we don't participate, we don't have that opportunity. And we'll let other people set values for us. Your participation is needed. If this is going to be an exercise that works and speaks to all of us, what you do and how you interact counts. And so I'm asking for your participation. I'm asking for your input through this series and there'll be more, it'll take quite a while for this to work through all the way. I'm sure next year sometime we'll come up with the final products or maybe it will be sooner, year, than sooner than that. Uh -huh. He'll tell you. But 
with that in mind, uh, I'm happy to see a good crowd here. And I wonder um, who's checking online stuff. How many do we have online right now? I think we have and almost 200, anybody? it looks like. 196. About 200 online and about 100 in the room, so that's great. Thank you. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce our chancellor, who has, has been through a number of value exercises in his life, who has built values-based organizations, organizations that share commitment, organizations that hire based off values, organizations that grow and thrive based off their values. And so with that, I give you our chancellor, Michael Williams, who will present to you a little bit more about the value journeys he's been involved in and about what this means to us and how we'll move forward together to create a stronger, better, healthier organization. Thank you all very much for coming today. And Michael, Thanks, Neil. the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Great introduction. Well, thank you all for being here. And thank you for every time I come up here, I feel so welcomed. Uh, it started last uh, last graduation and uh, in the spring and got to meet several of you uh, and then uh, from football games and other opportunities to be up here meeting a lot of different people uh, I've always been very very welcomed and uh, and it feels like a great place I will tell you that um, uh, when I was a uh, after graduating from medical school and my residency I got this crazy idea that I'd come up here and take programming so actually applied up here and got got in the school to computer science school uh, and I made it through DOS program which tells you how old I was uh, and actually programmed like yes and no and some real detailed stuff like that so uh, but anyway so the fun thing about me coming here that means a lot to me deeply personally is uh, my father graduated from here my brother graduated from here my nephew graduated from here not too long ago and and it's just been a part of a family journey uh and so this place has had special meaning as well as a lot of my family grew up in the Denton in the or, or lived in the denton area so uh every time i come here it brings back a lot of memories uh just being in the area but i wanted to echo uh a little bit of what neil said so uh which i thought he did a great job laying it out organizations by and large uh often have platitudes of which many can be included like a value statement, a purpose statement, a mission statement. And those things I personally believe a lot in. However, they don't have a lot of meaning if they're, they come from the leaders and they're just pushed down through the system and they become something on the wall. And so when we talk about a values-based organization or a values-based culture of, of people, it's looking at how do we create an environment in our workplace to where we know when we come to work that we get to bring each of us have our own separate values that we got either from our parents or grandparents our teachers or coaches or other sources uh, throughout our life that formed our own personal values and the idea is can you create a set of values and you don't really create them you just discover them that fit an organization of people and with those values, with each value, there's a set of behaviors that better explain how they define our community together. And if you can do that, then those have real meaning and power. Because then together, this is what we all formed. This is what we all believe in. And companies that I pay a lot of attention to who have done this, like Southwest Airlines, has 50,000 employees, 50,000 team members across the country, all with one set of values. But the point of values is you can have a set of values on the, on the wall. The point is, do they come to life in the daily life of the organization and the people that are there? And so that's what's really important here. So I would tell you, each and, each and every one of you had values. And the point is, how do we get those aligned with a place where we all come to work every day? So the, big, the biggest mistake that most organizations make when they want to come up with a set of values is they come from the leaders. And the thing about that, that might be the leader's values, but it's not the population in our community's values. So this process that Neil alluded to is a process that's very focused on going across the entire organization. So many people from UNT, people from UNT Dallas, the system offices, and as well as uh, the Health Science Center, 
will come together and work through a system by which that's a proven system by which those values will be uh, determined and discovered. And then those are brought back uh, to the leadership, not to change or edit, but to just adapt and go forward. So that's how that starts. And the process after that is then working together to define what those behaviors are. So if I can go through it real quick, I'll tell you this. Organizations have purpose statements. That's our why. That's why we exist. There's a mission statement, and the mission statement says what we do here. There's a vision statement that says where we're going. There's a strategic plan that says how we're going to get there. And then the values say these are the guard rules, the guardrails by which we live it within. So that's the power of values. You start to know the environment you're in and what you stand for. And uh, so I heard Neil talk about caring. And so, for example, caring as an example is part of the organizational history. I'd like to think it's it's across the entire system at every organization, but it's been especially important here. And so, for example, on caring, caring may very well be one of the actual selected values, but even if it's not, it's still a defined characteristic of the culture here. So. There are more things that define the culture beyond just the values. Values are just the five or six things that are name of words with a set of behaviors that begin that we all agree on. And so I want to be real clear that this does not take away from anything. It actually adds to and brings clarity to to uh, this. So. Um, but the first and foremost thing that has to happen in values based culture is building a culture of trust. And I've been in the system now for 10 years. I was a board member before that. And I know I've heard repeatedly, I have felt it even sometimes in my own, in my own life, that trust was lacking in, in the organization as a whole. Trust may have been great here, but trust across the system was often lacking. And so when I talk a lot about trust, people say, well, that takes years to build. And, and I think trust is, is something that goes both directions. Like if I, you know, where's where's Adam? There's Adam. I always, you know, I always look for the Mets hat. So if I say to Adam, I want you to trust me. Well, Adam gets to select if he wants to give me his trust, but then I have to offer it, and vice versa. So it's a it's a bi-directional part of the relationship. So when people talk to me about, hey, it takes years to build trust, then I'm always reminded of a story that I want to tell you just for a second. Uh, it's a story I share, shared at UNT Dallas several weeks ago. So for many years, you may not know, but I practiced medicine and I practiced anesthesiology and ICU medicine. And so my practice was predominantly cardiovascular surgery and neurosurgery. So that's what I did every day for, for almost 30 years. So part of my training was to uh, I was at the Texas Heart Institute in Houston for part of my fellowship, which is after you do that after for subspecialty training after you do your residency. And so every Wednesday at, at the Texas Heart Institute was pediatric day. And on pediatric day, our routine was to go out and meet the family because many of these families came from all over the world or all over the country. So we didn't get to see them necessarily the night before. And so we would walk out and meet them, see the see the baby or the child and uh, talk to them about the process that was about to happen. Many of these children had such severe cardiovascular defects that if they even started to cry from separation anxiety, they would become what we call cyanotic, a lacking in oxygen. And so if they did that, they could get into a cardiovascular situation that, that would go very badly. So we had to be very careful about that process. So the way we outlined the process for the mother or the father was like this. So I'll, I'm going to tell you specifically about one mother that was with her child and the uh, father was not, not there. I was, was, you know, I didn't know the story there. I didn't ask. So I started talking to this mother about what we we're about to do. And I said, so here's what's about to happen. I'm going to, now that I've seen the baby, I'm going to walk back to the operating room. I'm going to grab a syringe. That syringe is going to bring a drug with it that when I inject the baby, that baby's going to start going to sleep in a matter of seconds. And so what I have to do is grab that baby and walk briskly back to the operating room 
and get that baby asleep and under control before they start to wake up and cry. And so what that means is when I come back and we do that, there's no time for delay. There's no time for talk. And so are there any remaining questions you have? You know, no, I think I'm okay. So I go back to the operating room. I get the syringe in my hand. I walk back out. And our process was this. The babies all had these small gowns on. And because we didn't want to stir anything up, or we would literally just inject right through their gown into their thigh. And then it started right, right away. And so in this case, I walked out with a syringe. I've got the mothers watching me. I go to grab the baby's leg and inject the medicine. And before I can, she grabs my wrist. And she grabbed my wrist like this. Okay, I don't know if you've ever thought about grabbing somebody's wrist like this. But it's a whole lot more secure than this or even a handshake. Because with this, there's not much break in it. And in that moment, she grabbed, when she grabbed me, she said, I've just got to tell you one more thing. He's all I've got. So please bring him back to me. Because about a year ago, I lost my husband and my other child in a car accident. So granted, this is stuck a few seconds before I'm getting ready to walk in and take care of her baby. So I tried to nod and, 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 and in that very moment show the compassion that you feel in those moments. But I walked away with that baby. We, we did the surgery and, and everybody always asked me how to go and all that. The, the baby did fine. In the end, the baby did fine. But what lesson she taught me in that moment was that trust at the highest level with the most valued asset, which I believe is our love and care for someone or our heart. She gave that to me in that moment. She didn't need years. She had to make a decision in that moment to trust. So I'm not expecting everyone on all our campuses to offer trust in the first five minutes of us talking, but I do want you to understand that trust is a powerful tool. Trust is what changes the organization. Trust is what allows a values-based situation to begin and to grow and grow and grow. And in a trust relationship, we certainly may have mistakes and we allow for some forgiveness of those mistakes or are, are helping people work through those mistakes. That's just part of being together. So it starts with trust. And it starts with a yearning to build something together bigger than we've ever seen it before. Now, I can't do that. Neil can't do that. It takes all of us to do that, working together. So I wanted to share that we're about trust and I wanted to talk about for a second we have a vision statement now that says by 2026, and this, this is a vision statement that the board helped us work through and the board has, has uh, seen and agrees with. By 2026, the UNT system is one team. Doesn't mean we're all alike. Doesn't mean we're all in the same place. It does mean we share a common purpose that we're here to educate students and to take care of students and their families. That's our, in a, nut, in a nutshell, I think that's what we're all here for. It's certainly what I'm here for. So we're one group of people sharing a common purpose. We're focused on students and their families. And with an emphasis on excellence, what I mean by excellence is excellence in the ordinary, I call it. What does that mean? It means in those daily routines we go through, that we start to take for granted, or we that we just as part of our job, that we still stop and think, how can I do this in the most excellent way? And then we approach it with curiosity. Can this be better? Tied to innovation. So this vision is what we build a strategy towards. It's what we're working on now. And uh, the vision does the details where we're going. And so people sitting here might go, well, how in the world am I innovative? Well, so what I would tell you is by and large, 
all of you do work every single day by which you're the most expert at that job in the whole system. And so how can you help us understand how to help you do your job better? That's what that means. Because you know ways, and I get, the, you know, I always used to get the quote about, well, if they only knew how we, what we have to do here, and if they only knew what they could do to fix it, what I'm telling you is we're giving, we want people to have license to bring ideas forward about how to, how to help you help your, your work to go better and go easier and to be done in a more, more excellent way that I want, which I got to believe everyone here is for that. So one other thing we're saying is uh, we're working on together is a, what's called a uh, uh, consolidated strategic plan. It's something we've really never had before. We've had each campus had a strategic plan, system had a strategic plan, but they didn't in any way work in concert. So it's not again, it's not the situation where the system dictates strategy or what we're going to go do. It's where the campuses design theirs, system designs what's needed, and we find a way to coordinate it and correlate it. So with one, one strategic plan, we, we will go towards achieving that vision that I just laid out. So some people also ask me, well, wait a minute. Before I sign on to this values-based culture, what exactly does that mean? What does that look like? And here's what it looks like. I already talked about it's a high trust environment. It's an environment where there is no we versus them. I'll be the first to tell you, when I was at the Health Science Center over the past 10 years, I sometimes was one of the worst people about we versus them. I felt like in many ways we were not allowed to live in the work that we needed to do. But I want, I want to change that. I want to do away with we versus them and make sure we're all understanding that we're here working together again for the same common purpose. There's open sharing of information and transparency. And every time you hear from me, I'm going to be my absolute, do my absolute best to make sure we're being transparent about what the information is that you need to do your job. It's a people first culture. What's a people first culture? People first culture is a culture where we have meaningful people systems, how we hire, how we promote, how we reward and recognize, how people get selected for certain positions. It's also about things like wellness, psychological safety, the environment they're in. Do you have the tools you need to do your job? Are you allowed to do your job? Are you told with some, uh, 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 by somebody in your area, hey, you're doing a good job, or hey, I could use your help on this? That begins to create more of a people first culture. So when we look at everything we do, we look at our people. First, we look at our students and families. Second, along the, almost at the exact same level, we look at our people because they all are, are people that we are here to serve. It's, a, it's an environment of teamwork and collaboration. I can tell you right now here, uh, like I know Mike, Mike, I know you're here somewhere. Mike, yeah, there he is. So Mike serving as a provost has already demonstrated in many ways as well as uh, Pam. Pam, are you here? Oh, yeah, there you are. Uh, has demonstrated the same thing. It was a willingness to collaborate around, for example, research and academics with the other campuses to see what can we do together that becomes more exponentially powerful than everybody doing it by themselves. Because we've had historically a lot of redundancy, a lot of duplication, and we think there's ways we can help each other uh, add value to what it is you have to offer here and what others have to offer at Dallas and Fort Worth. And then uh, the other thing I want to make sure is, you know, is I talked about we need to no longer live the golden rule, but live the platinum rule. The golden rule says treat others like what? About uh, like I want to be treated, right? But there may be people that don't want to be treated like I want to be treated. So the platinum rule, does anybody know the platinum rule? As if anybody's going to raise their hand. Oh, yeah, you do. Do you mind sharing? Do unto others as they want to have done to them or how they would like to be treated. That's the platinum rule. It's a different mindset. 
Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is uh, two, two things. One, two of the characteristics are we, we want to hire based on the four C's. Does anybody know the four C's? I don't. First and foremost, they're in this order too. We hire first and foremost for character. Because character is the first thing and the only thing you can't train. And boy, does it involve a lot of problems later on. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Second of all, culture. Do they fit the culture we're building here? And it's not meaning there's anything wrong with them. It means they just may not be a fit here. Not against anything. I'm not not against anything in New York City. But if I moved to New York City, like like some people I know with, uh, who live there, I probably wouldn't fit in that well. I've got a funny accent. I do things funny. I drive a pickup. It probably wouldn't go as well. So do they fit our culture? And third, it's chemistry. Do they have a chemistry that when they when we add them to our team, they add value to our team? Everybody knows when we add somebody to our team, it changes the dynamics of the team. And then lastly, and least important, is competency in a job. Because we can train competency, we can enhance competency. Now granted, you gotta have a basic competency for what is needed. And I'm not saying it's so far removed. I think these are very close to each other in terms of importance. But I just go on and on and on and on about character. If we don't get character right, it's going to be a miserable existence together. And so lastly, a values-based culture is not a utopia. It's not a heaven on earth. It's, a, it's just a whole lot better than what many of us exist in in environments where we don't have them. So that's an important piece to remember. So lastly, I talked about we're working on a strategy together. Uh, Neil had members of the team here. We have members from the UNT Dallas campus, the Hill Science Center campus, and the system campus come together and begin thinking about what are the most important things we've got to do here. And as we work towards that over the next couple of months and get the board to weigh in on it as well, we'll certainly be sharing that with everyone sort of sometime after the Thanksgiving holidays. So I want to let you know about that as well. Let me stop there and see if there's any, uh, any questions and then uh, we'll go from there. Good afternoon. We do have one question that you both have touched on this morning, um, but it's asked frequently. Karen has been a deep value for us at UNT. Will it still be one of our main values when this process is over? I, I mean, I, I think I hit on that earlier a little bit. I think you can't predict what these values are going to be because I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to be the one telling people what they are. It's going to be a population of I forget how many how many people totally we have. 125 people who were hand selected from each each campus are coming together on November 7th and 8th, by which I can tell you the last experience I had like this was at the Health Science Center 10 years ago. There were they looked at a thousand words and the meanings of those words over those two days, and they distilled it down to the top six. And then they came back and we talked about how that gets to find out. So that's how the process works. So people, several people from the UNT representation will be would be a part of that process. But I can't I can't tell you for sure. Caring, but again, if caring is not one of them, that doesn't mean we live without caring. We we definitely include caring in, in the things we do. I don't know how we take care of students and families if we don't care about them. So it, it's interesting. Um, hello, am I on? It, it's interesting. You talked about trust. Uh, we have 56 members of 125 people who are going to be going through this. If there'll be collaboration during this exercise, there'll be consensus building, there'll be words that people fight over fiercely and words that get thrown out the window real fast. Uh, but with a good representation from this campus of people who I believe have a good spirit, and good hearts, will reach an understanding of the things that matter most to this campus and the other campuses. Absolutely. And what I would say is the people who are on this committee are people I trust. Mm -hmm. And I think you would trust. So I think we'll get a good outcome. I agree. And, and by the way, this is the, ta the town halls that are 
for me opportunities to share with you ideas and, 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 re, and get questions. Uh, we'll, we'll be having more of these along the way, so to keep you informed along the process. We have another question from the in-person audience. With the timing of this town hall, the hours of 1 to 2 p.m., that is when a lot of students are in class, how can you make this town hall more accessible to students? Can you change the time or perhaps offer other times to allow more students to make it? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I didn't select the time, so I, I, I kind of like do what my schedule tells me, but uh, uh, um, certainly, I mean, when I was in the hospital business, we would do morning, evening and night, deep night, like three and two or three in the morning. So uh, we do what we have to do to make sure those that are interested uh, want to be a part of it. We, we get in front of them. So. What is the system plan to advance diversity, equity and inclusion at UNT? Several of us are concerned about the elimination of DEI staff in the system office. That's a question we received in person and online. You know, I think DEI is a very important part of what we do. Uh, and DEI is uh, not underrepresented in the system. We changed the structure. Donna Asher, who, who unfortunately is ill today, uh, oversees our uh, people in equity and culture. Um, and uh, it's a very important to me personally, and it's very important, I know, to our team. I'll also tell you, though, from my own personal experience, that a values-based culture uh, goes a long way to support and promote the principles of DEI, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. So when, when the when a lot of the DEI uh, departments and groups were being formed on campus, we had a conversation like this at the Health Science Center, and somebody asked me, "How come DEI is?" Uh, not on the strategy. Well, it's because it was already woven through what we were trying to do. We just needed to call it out more. So we had values of serving others first. And under that value, there were several behaviors that addressed the ENI, how we treated each other, how we served each other, how we respected, uh, respected each other. We also had a value of respect. And under respect, it talked, there was one of the behaviors I'll never forget that said, I'll always respect the perspectives and the ideas of those different from me. And then there was also one on collaboration. And I will collaborate with those who have different ideas than me. So DNI is a, and in terms of a structural part of the organization is absolutely there. Uh, in terms of programmatic things, there are programmatic things that are going on, on every campus. But I would also tell you that working together to build a values based culture only enhances that work and makes it stronger. Another one from the in-person audience. Often system process improvement increases workload downstream. For future process changes, could the entire workflow be considered? Well, we're taking a different approach to, to continuous process improvement than what's been done in the past. Um, so, uh, I have an expert here in that that whole thing, uh, that whole area, uh, Jeff Darnaby. Jeff was somebody who I worked with in the hospital world. Prior to that, he was at Toyota as part of their team and understood continuous process improvement for Toyota and, and Lean, Toyota Lean. And um, I know personally going through my experience in the hospital world, seeing him and his team transform an entire hospital from the perspective of continuous process improvement. It, it, it is something we've started here. Right now, it's, it's at a limited level because we've been getting Jeff uh, ingrained, but I know he's. we've had a lot of problems in the procurement area, and that was the first place he started was in procurement. And I think when you see how that team works, they do go downstream to, to the process of understanding the user end of it, as well as the people in the offices that have to do the, do the actual work. There's, uh, they're also engaged on the research side, starting with the Health Science Center to look at some of the systems that slow down grant processes or cause hiccups in the grant processes. And uh, Jeff, um, why don't you take a minute and just kind of talk about some of the work you're doing. Okay. Yeah, so Jeff Darnby, I'm Chief Transformation Officer um, with the system. 
Uh, so, like Chancellor Williams said, we you know we started out working in procurement, but to go back to the uh, to the question, um, when we look at a process or we look at a a value stream, okay, we'll we'll look at that value stream from uh, from the supplier focus. Uh, so so who does it come from? Where does the product start? And then all the way through to where the product ends, and understand um, along the way all of the different handoffs that occur. Uh, and how a change at uh, a level one process might impact, um, you know, uh, accounts payable at the end of that process. So um, there, there's uh, rigorous um, mapping that that goes on at a at a very high level, uh, and then we drill down and we get into actually like click level processes. So uh, I'll give you an example, uh, just real quick in procurement. So something that occurs in procurement. Uh, when they when they're processing an invoice uh, or a requisition, if someone puts a requisition in um, that has 10 lines on it and 10 requisitions come in within an hour, when they run their work list, it generates 100 lines of requisitions. They've got to go in first and deduplicate the the spreadsheet, their work list. So they've got to take a bunch of lines out. They've got to take columns and reduce them from 40 to, to four. Uh, because there's unnecessary information that's built into uh, their work list. So it's just one example of how we've developed systems that uh, create waste. And that waste, you know, takes extra time to process. So we, you know, we don't get our product when we need it. Uh, we're we're underutilizing our staff because, you know, they you know, if you take that five or ten minutes of time out of that process to to make it more streamlined, then they're able to pass it on to the next person. So we look at that all the way through the system. So we've seen that uh, a similar thing um, in all the areas of procurement uh, with with contracting and strategic sourcing and um, our supplier management as well. So um, again, a value stream approach looks at every single step along the way from start to finish. Thanks, Jeff. You, you, I, I want to jump in on that just a little bit too. Um, one of the conversations Michael and I have, and we've had at the cabinet level, I've had with Greg, I've had with Juan and others, is that uh, we're not perfect right now. Uh, we're not close to it. Uh, system, uh, no offense to Michael right now, system shared services were a mess long before I got here. Mm -hmm. And you don't, unscrew that mess overnight. Uh, but there's a sincere effort to do. It. Mm -hmm. That's right. And what that means is we have to be good partners and collaborators. System has to receive the feedback uh, that we give them and they can't be better uh, if we don't participate in the process. And so our job is to not sit there and shake our fists but to sit there and say, well, you know, you tried that, it was a little better, now we could fix this over here or we're still having some problem over there. And working together uh, as partners, we can improve what's happening now. And there's some early evidence that that's going on. Yeah, I would tell you that the most important thing about continuous process improvement is just starting off by listening and understanding what uh, people, everybody along the process needs to, uh, needs to wants to tell about what they have in the process so uh, just done listening and as jeff talked about mapping it all out and understanding where can we really add value what steps can we take out just and that goes back to what i talked about earlier about being innovative if there are innovative if there are ideas you have about your process being better that's part of that working together and where we want to go because we agree we i was a customer of the shared services for 10 years was not happy with what we got uh, I'm committed and I know our team's committed to to fixing that problem because with the campuses are actually the customers as well as well as we are uh, of our own systems. So that's where we're headed. And, and by the way, uh, I, I suspect there's a lot of general questions that are being asked. I might want to see if we can relate those back to the values journey that we're going on. Uh, if you ask me if this is a concern process improvement and what we're doing, what's the value that you'd wrap around that? You know, a, a value of high integrity work, a value of collaboration. Uh, we need to be thinking along those lines if this is an outcome that is desirable. 
All right, we have a question from the online audience. How was the selection made for the UNT campus in terms of the process journey? Who are the members representing the UNT campus? Will we find out? You mentioned transparency, so it would be helpful and build trust if we could see who the representatives are. Uh, yeah, we have a, uh, we got a rubric basically from system as they were designing the values based journey and it didn't say who do you put on specifically it said here's the kind of representation we want and made sure there was a good representation from uh, kind of our foundation uh, people who know the campus uh, and have been here uh, who work day to day kind of you know doing the good the good work of higher ed uh, and then some layering we were asked to create a diverse group, a group that reflected uh, our uh, growingly diverse population that was gender diverse, that was leadership diverse. I believe there's only one cabinet member uh, on this group. So this isn't a top heavy executive group. It's a, a group that we think represents um, people who really care about UNT, you know, kind of, I, I will hesitate to use the word star performers, but <clears throat> people who are kind of the champions of what we do here at this university. And we will definitely share the names. We're, I think that group is still being assimilated finally. and It'll be uh, put together in the next coming few days. And so, but there's no uh, back to building trust and then transparency. There's no uh, effort to hide the names. It's more about just making sure everybody will agree to serve and has been asked to serve. So that should be coming in the next few days or a few week or two, I would think, well before November 7th and 8th. And by the way, aside from that, there'll be a lot of opportunities for the community abroad to participate and that information will be brought in as part of the kind of funnel process to get it down to what the values that we're going to represent are. Yeah. We have another one from our in-person audience. How will the university do with the housing crisis besides the build, besides the building of new dorms, which take a few years? And as a part two of this question, how does the provost respond to the fact that RA's contracts were broken as they were promised not to have roommates? <laughs> okay, this is part of our deal. values journey. Uh, uh, so a few different concepts. Let's first talk about housing. Housing was really full this year. We've had more freshmen by over a thousand, fifteen hundred, seventeen hundred more freshmen than we've ever had before. Uh, housing was full early. We were unable to accommodate most of the upperclassmen in the residence halls who wanted to be in housing. Uh, and if you've been reading the newspapers, this is a crisis across the country as freshmen returned in a post COVID age. Uh, we want to build more residence halls. We're struggling with how the bonding for that and the system bond ratings work in order for us to be able to do it, but there's no question we could build a residence hall that would take a thousand now and we could fill it. So with the problem that we have, we asked some of our RAs to make a sacrifice. And, I, and I'm sad that we had to do it, but in order to have a value around serving our students and supporting their success, we asked for more students to be put into rooms and RAs to double up. Uh, not an ideal solution, not a solution that we've ever had to employ before, but with extraordinary crowding, uh, we felt it was the most equitable and it gave as many of our students a fair chance at being in a residence hall as possible. As far as parking, uh, this interview is over. <laughs> uh, I, uh, uh, I, I don't believe actually there is a true parking crisis on campus. What there is, is I can't park as close to where I want to be and it's not convenient for me to park on campus. And I get that. Uh, I And I know no one will really care what I'm going to say next, but I'm going to say it anyhow. In my past three campuses, there was no student parking on campus. It simply wasn't there, there was some at UT, it was called the South 40. I'm sure that's inadequate now as well. So uh, parking's a problem on every campus in the country. There are very few places that can afford large flat field parking place, places. 
parking structures are now coming in at about $30,000 of space, maybe more in, in the current environment, could be up to 34 by now. Uh, I'm sure Steve, uh, Steve could answer all of this, uh, but I will put you on the spot right now, okay? Uh, what, what I will say is that uh, we're willing to better promote parking in some of our more remote facilities, and we've been trying to add shuttle bus routes and other uh, ways for people to get back and forth uh, to make it a little bit more convenient to park in some of the far-flung facilities. But I don't anticipate quick fixes for parking in the near future, and I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to figure out what the value around parking is. <laughs> and we'll get to you on that later. Another one from in person. Communication seems to be a large pain point in the system, particularly in regard to HR. How can we expect to, to, to improve that? How and when? Recent examples include comp time, parental leave, tuition benefit taxation. How can we say we're caring when we don't communicate? Well, I can tell you, I, I can't, I don't know if uh, Katie's here, uh, I think. Okay. Oh, there you are. Uh, I think what I would tell you is uh, uh, communication, certainly from uh, me and our office, is very important. That's why uh, you're getting uh, personal emails from me uh, at least every other week uh, that cover a topic that I want to cover. Uh, but as far as the HR communications, that's something uh, that I'll probably turn over more to the expertise of Katie. Uh, Thank you. So in, in an organization our size, right, communication is always a challenge. I think we look in our own departments, right, and, and would agree sometimes. And I think like most departments, sometimes we struggle with how to get information out there. We work really closely with HR liaisons across campus, and those are individuals in every department who come to a monthly meeting with the campus HR unit, and those are the individuals who oversee your hiring processes, your EPARs, all of those things in the department, and we really try to keep them updated on what's coming up um, in terms of implementation, uh, you know, what are the priorities in HR? What are the changes? Um, you know, and we work to do the HR highlights newsletter. Uh, we push out notices to supervisors on things that they need to know. So we have a constant effort to try to review communication. It's not perfect. Um, and we welcome feedback and suggestions at any time, right, in terms of how we can improve to get information out there. Because the information we deal with in HR is very personal. Right, we're talking about pay, benefits, the employment experience, and so it's really important that we remain connected and can both push and receive information in a timely, meaningful way. Uh, sometimes we have, you know, delays maybe that are not necessarily within our control. Parental leave was a big topic um, last year. That legislation was passed last summer. Had to do some legal analysis, right, on the taxation part that was mentioned in this question, and it took us a little bit of time right to get that done and to be able to get the policy built and the communication out. But our effort is certainly to communicate as timely as possible. And again, I'm open to all suggestions in terms of how we can improve that. And we have another question from the online audience. As most have little awareness of their interactions with the system in general, how do you see the unification of values across the system affecting our day to day operations and interactions among students, faculty and administrators? I think the unification of values comes down to uh, uh, each and every one of us. So when those values are determined by the group uh, of people from across the system, uh, one of the first steps they will do is take it back to leadership to say these are the values we selected and we want to know are you willing to live these values and are, this is my experience from previous places uh, and we want to know if you're going to live these values or not and it's not an option for you're going to change the values it's an option do you do you as a leader want to be a part of this because this is what the team across the organization have said so the unification of values is not my, Michael Williams doing all the work and going out giving a bunch of speeches. It's about each and every one of you taking the time to understand what those values are 
understand how over time, how transformative that can be and understand those behaviors. And I used to keep a copy of ours at the Health Science Center, the copy at the hospital before that on my desk all the time. And they helped me make decisions. They helped me uh, look at how I discussed things with people that were controversial, as well as other things that we, we easily agreed on. So it really comes down to each and every one of you being willing to, to trust the process and be ambassadors for understanding what the values can mean. I don't know if you all you know, like to fly Southwest Airlines. I don't know if you like to eat at Chick-fil-A. I don't know what the companies are you like. You know, Salesforce, we use them. All those companies are values-based companies. If you ever want to read a great book about values, the impact of values, read any book about Chick-fil-A or read any book, uh, like a book called Trailblazers, by Mark Benioff, who started, started uh, Salesforce, and he will talk about how they started Salesforce without a set of values that they live by. They just had a set of values on a wall. And what they did was they ran into all kinds of problems ultimately because they didn't have anything that brought them together. And then they stopped, couldn't figure out what was going on, decided to come back and build a set of values, build a values-based culture. And over time, you can see what it did for the company. And he talks about that transformative process. So think about where you like to spend your dollars, where you feel valued as a customer, and that will probably more than likely give you a sense of what companies are values-based companies and which ones aren't. Uh, I'll probably get in trouble for doing this, but I'll tell you as, as a customer, I don't feel like American Airlines has a lot of values because of the way I get treated. Normally, I don't call out companies, but I think you need to understand the wide difference in a true core values-based organization and one that just has them on the wall. Uh, so it's going to be up to you all to be the ambassadors. I can't do this. All I can do is tell you what it's like to live in a place like that. And once you've been lived in a place like that, you don't ever want to go back to anything else. So that's how I would say it gets spread. Uh, Michael, would you like to make any closing remarks? Yeah, I would just encourage, uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate all of you for being here. If we didn't get to your question uh, here, we will answer all the questions and you'll, you will get a response uh, back. Uh, if there are several of them that are li listed as anonymous, we'll try to find somebody who put their name on it that we'll send the, we'll make sure the email goes out to where people can see, because uh, I'm sure there's many other questions that we couldn't get to in the time. But I would encourage you to be at the town halls like you are today. It, the engagement means a lot, and it helps us communicate directly without having to depend on emails and other forms of that. I would also tell you that there's going to be listing sessions, which are much more small group together. And then there will be chancellor forums, uh, which are much more topical things that we want to talk about. So those will all be coming as part of what we talked about earlier, which is this trying to build a vibrant communication uh, platform and process. See if there's anything else I had. What I did with my, here it is. So, oh, the Gallup survey. Gallup survey opened on uh, this week. I would encourage you to fill the Gallup survey out. I'm not here to ever tell you how to fill it out. What I am going to tell you though is what we're after is the high levels of engagement. So we want the highest percentages of people filling that out. And uh, that really means a lot. So I would uh, I would really encourage you to do that as well. So um, I think the bottom line that I want to leave you with is this. Live with a little bit of curiosity. Live with a willingness to trust even if that trust gets violated because we drop the ball, we make a mistake here and there, just please know that the heart of the team, I can tell you at the system, is to do everything we can to help the campuses do what the hard work they've got to do better, easier, in a values-based culture. So there's also an email where you can contact me and we'll, again, we'll, we'll be back to you with all these answers. Please come back to the next town hall. Please be available for the listening sessions. And let us continue this exchange of communication. Well, that's all I had. Here. Thank you. I want to thank the chancellor. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.
And thank all of you for coming and listening. And I know that you'll be ambassadors for how we conduct ourselves through a values journey. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at some of our town halls and listening sessions. And I look forward to seeing all of you as you engage in this process. And your involvement is really key to its success. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being involved. And uh, we'll see you at the next stop. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs>